Philippians chapter 3. The Bible says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That's what this day is all about. This is Easter, but actually what Easter is, is it is Resurrection Sunday. This is the day that Jesus got out of the grave. This is the day that death, hell, and sin were defeated for all of eternity. So I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. And I kind of wish the verse stopped there because that's the good part. But then it says, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Can I just give you a spoiler alert? We're celebrating a resurrection that took place. But this verse lets us know that resurrections are still supposed to be happening today. See, we're not just celebrating Jesus' resurrection. We're celebrating the fact that through him, you and I get to take part in resurrection as well. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to say a word of prayer over our time together. God, thank you for your presence that we felt today. Thank you that you did rise from the grave. God, we're just, we're so humbled and honored by the fact that you took our sin and that you conquered our mistakes and you conquered death. And so today we celebrate that. But God, I just pray that you would give us grace to truly see what that means for our lives in these next few moments. Would you meet us in this place? Let your presence be in this room. And we give you glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give it up for our worship team today, man? They did so good. They did so good. I have, uh, I've always loved music from a young age. My parents are, are very musical. Uh, Mom and dad both traveled and sang for a while when I was, before I was born. And then after I was born, I was the second. And my, my brother was seven years older than me. And so they didn't travel as much. But always music has been a big part of our life. And so I started playing music when I was nine years old. I started playing drums at my church. And that's really impressive until you find out there were 20 people in my church. And so it wasn't that I was beating all these people out for the position. It was that I was the only person that even cared that drums were in the room. And so they let me play them. And uh, so I started playing drums and eventually developed into other uh, other instruments as well. And at about 13, I started playing guitar. And that really became the thing that I was, I was more passionate about, that I was more excited about. I love to play, the, I love to play acoustic guitar. Uh, I, I appreciate guys that can play lead and can shred and do all the Van Halen and all that stuff. You know, like I, that just was never me. I just always loved to play acoustic, and I tried to make the chords as pretty as they could be. And so we had a friend that was a family friend of ours that worked at a, a little boutique music store in Saint, the St. Louis area, and from that he had been connected with some of the, the bigger name dealers like Fender and Taylor and Martin and all those, and actually had been so connected with Taylor that he had began to be a promo guitar player for them. He was just an amazing uh, guitar player, especially acoustic guitar player, so he, he filmed some promo videos for Taylor. And throughout that process, he had gotten connected with the owner, and the owner had this, this limited series of guitars that he himself had handmade. The owner's name, I think, was Robert Taylor, and he released these guitars called R. Taylor Guitars, and they were all handmade. They were gorgeous. They were absolutely amazing guitars, stunning woodwork, like, and they, they just sounded beautiful. And so he had one of these guitars that had been given to him by the owner. We happened to be at the same event one day. With, I was with my dad, and this guy was there. And he was playing that guitar, and he knew I played. And he said, hey, man, you want to you play this? And I said, yeah, sure. Like, so I sat down and started playing, and it was just it was beautiful. Like, it was an immersive experience. I'm just I'm lost in this. It's gorgeous to look at. It's gorgeous to play. It sounds good. And in the midst of while I'm doing this, him and my dad are talking. And he says, hey, you know, you know how much that guitar is worth? And I'm probably 15 at this time, and I'm thinking, well, pff, it's probably worth at least $1,000. I mean, this is, you know. He said, yeah, it's worth about $20,000. And that was 20 years ago. I'm going to tell you something. Every bit of enjoyment that I was getting out of playing that guitar, the moment the words $20,000 left his lips, I said, get this thing out of my hands as quickly as you possibly can. Because I am not about to go in debt for an R. Taylor guitar. It ain't going to happen today. It just blew my mind. It It was this high value, this high cost that I couldn't understand. Today I'm preaching to you about the concept of high price. 
Because whenever we have this moment to where we, we attribute or we find out that a value is attributed to a product, sometimes it, 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 it makes us take a step back. Have you ever had that moment where your friend has something and, and you see them using it and you're like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. That's a pretty functional product. I would love to have that. Then you get on Amazon and you're like, that costs how much? Like, what do you do for a living? That, that, that's something you have in your house, you know, or, or the car they drive or whatever. We, we see the value on these things and it blows our minds a little bit. Well, today we're talking about something that was done for us, a price that was paid for us that is so exorbitantly high. You see, Jesus was the Son of God, and I think it can be real easy in church circles. I talked about this a little bit with the team before we, we started our first service today. Because we can, we can get so used to hearing these things that we miss the gravity of it. And so if you've never been to church and you're here today, man, we're so glad you're here. This story is the best story to ever be told. If you've been in church your whole life and you've heard this story a million times, this story is the best story that can be told. That the Son of God wrapped himself in flesh left heaven, came and lived on the earth, and ultimately died for my sin. That is a high price. But when I find out about the high value, the high cost, the high price of something, usually once the, the sticker shock wears off a little bit, my next question is why? Why does that cost that much? Like why would someone pay that much money for that thing? And so today my question is, knowing that he paid such a high price, knowing that the cost of his life is what was actually spent, why was that necessary? Why did it cost so much? As we enter into Holy Week this week, that's, that's what we refer to the week leading up to, to the Resurrection Sunday. It's Passion Week, Holy Week, and last Sunday was, was, was Palm Sunday when, there, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem and they laid palm branches on the ground celebrating him. Hosanna, we're glad he's here. And somewhere between the Sunday that they celebrated him and the Friday night that he was arrested, the entire cultural concept of who Jesus was had shifted. And they go from saying, Hosanna, praise him, the king in the highest, to saying, crucify him. Which, by the way, there's a whole message there that people's entire opinion can change in a very quick minute. So maybe don't put so much stock in people's opinions, but that's not, that's not what we're preaching about on Resurrection Sunday. But Jesus shows up and he, he's crucified for us, but why did he have to pay this price? In order for us to understand the extravagance of the cost that he paid, I think it's important for us to clarify the product that he purchased. What is it that he paid for? If you come to church, if you've been to church, if you're around churchy people, it's easy to hear this concept of, well, Jesus paid the price to forgive your sin. And that sounds good. Because I don't know about you, when I mess up, I like to be forgiven. I like it. I like the power that the words I'm sorry possess. You know, as a husband, they're the best words that you can know in the world. Even if you're not wrong, just say, I'm sorry. I'm just, that's a marriage tip for you right there. Just even if you didn't do it, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have. Whatever I didn't do, I'm sorry I didn't do it. You know, that's, that's kind of that's where we're at. But I'm sorry is a powerful thing because forgiveness is an amazing thing. And so even if that was what was purchased, that'd be awesome. But the truth is the cross, this, this, is, a, this is a bold statement. And a lot of my churchy people, you're probably going to be like, what are you talking about? The cross wasn't about forgiveness. Oh, how can you say that, Pastor Tyler? Y'all real quiet today, so you're making me nervous. That's good. What, is that, what does that mean when you say the cross wasn't about forgiveness? Well, the reason that I say that with confidence is because Jesus was forgiving people long before the cross. Jesus is teaching in a house, and people have heard about this miracle-working man that is traveling the region and touching people's blind eyes and they're seeing. And so word gets out on this group of friends, four guys that, that have this friend that is paralyzed. And they say, man, it would be cool if he could walk. And maybe this Jesus that's healing everybody else will heal him. And so they bring him to this house and they try to get in the door. But obviously they weren't following social distancing guidelines because you couldn't get in the door. That was a joke and nobody laughed. Man, y'all tough today in the second service. Y'all tough. So they said, we can't get in the door, and they crawl up onto the roof of the house, 
and they start to tear the roof off. They lower this guy down before Jesus. Again, crowd everywhere. Jesus is teaching. All of a sudden, ceiling tiles come off. Here comes a guy lowered down. I mean, you just got to put yourself in this context. This is a strange scenario. Jesus is talking to the people in the roof. What are y'all doing? They're like, hey, he needs to be healed. Will you heal him? Jesus says something crazy that nobody expected. He doesn't say you're healed. He said your sins are forgiven. Jesus is still alive. He's not gone to the cross. He's not bled one drop of blood, and he says your sins are forgiven you. The cross wasn't about forgiveness. Another place, Jesus goes to a man named Simon's house. He's sitting there for dinner, and out of nowhere, the door busts open, and this crazy, passionate woman comes in, breaks open a jar of perfume or oil or alabaster that's worth a year's wages, breaks them over Jesus' feet, begins to dry his feet with her hair, and everybody's just looking around like, what is going on right now? And Jesus doesn't look at her and say, wow, this is amazing. He doesn't say, look at this guy. He says, woman, your sins are forgiven you. Multiple times throughout Scripture, while Jesus is still alive, he's forgiving sins. The cross wasn't about forgiveness. Why does that matter, Pastor Tyler? Like, is this just a cute point that you're making? The reason it matters is because if you only approach the cross from the perspective of needing to be forgiven, then you will always go back to the pattern that you need to be forgiven of in the first place. Because if I come to the cross just saying, will you forgive me of my wrong, he will. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. But there's another half to that. Not only does he forgive our sins, but it goes on to say, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgiveness is only half of the gospel. And so if you only come to the crucifixion and the cross with the mindset that I need to be forgiven, then you're missing the entire point. You're missing what God has for you because it is about more than forgiveness. And truly, when we approach the cross from just this perspective, this is a harsh statement, but I believe it with all my heart. When we approach the cross from the perspective of it's only about forgiveness, we're actually devaluing the cross. I don't know if you remember back when iPads first came out and... Uh, there was there was a German comedy sketch, and the only reason I know about this is because it was when social media was just coming on the scene a little bit, so people were sharing everything, and there was this German comedy sketch of this lady who is in her kitchen with her elderly father, and they're chopping up vegetables, getting ready to, to eat eat dinner, and she asks her dad, she's like, hey, how are you enjoying that new iPad that we got you? And he said, oh, it's it's working great. She said, well, what's your favorite apps? And he's like, What are you talking about? And then he walks over with the iPad and he starts scraping vegetables off of it because he's been using it as a cutting board. Like, it will function in that capacity. But why in the world would you pay that much for a cutting board? Makes no sense. It's devaluing the product. And so, yes, you can find forgiveness at the cross. Don't get me wrong. But to only find forgiveness at the cross is devaluing the product. It's devaluing what he paid for. Because when you come to the cross from a forgiveness-based mindset, you get stuck in what I call a sin cycle. To where you commit the wrong, you have the failure, you watch the thing, you say the thing, you break the relationship, you lie, you steal, you whatever. Come to the cross, Lord, I'm sorry that I ABC. I'm sorry that I did that. He says you're forgiven. You go back. Nothing has changed, and so you immediately return to the same sin. And you have to come back to the cross. Lord, I'm sorry I did the thing. He forgives you. You go back to the Because when you have a forgiveness-based gospel, that's all you can ever get is forgiveness. But I want to tell you something today. The cross was not only about forgiveness. It was about freedom. I want to let somebody know today that you don't got to live a life that you got to keep being forgiven for. There is a God in heaven that wants to intervene in your situation and set you free today. He wants to break some chains in your life. I think a lot of us, the reason why we settle for a forgiveness-based gospel is because we've misdiagnosed what our real problem is. We think, well, sin is my problem, and so if I can be forgiven for the sin that I've done, then I'd be good. But here's my question to you today. I just want to make you think today. That's honestly my my main goal today is to make you think. Is sin a symptom 
or is sin the source of your problem? Because the thing is, we think that when I do something wrong, that makes me a sinner. So therefore, I'm a sinner because I sin. I don't mean to be circularly reasoning today. I don't mean to put in double talk or make you confused. But we think that I'm a sinner because I sin. I submit to you that you sin because you're a sinner. Your activity is determined by your condition, not vice versa. We think that what I do has caused me to be who I am, but it's because you are who you are that you do what you do. I I, I promise you, I'm not trying to be confusing. This is not just something that we find in scriptural truth. I've been reading a whole lot of books over the last couple of years about habits because, frankly, I'm trying to form some good ones, like, you know, going to the gym. Oh, I just threw up in my mouth a little bit when I said it. But like trying to eat better and and trying to get myself in shape. And do you realize that even secular sources, like no religious affiliation, no reference to the Bible, nothing, they make this statement. I've read several different books that make the same thing. That before you can see a change in your activity, you have to assume a new identity. As long as you think you are the person that you've always been, you're going to keep doing the same things that you've always done. That is scriptural truth spoken by people that got no idea they're talking about scripture. Because you think you're going to to modify your behavior to the place that you're going to somehow be acceptable to God. I'm telling you, your activity cannot change until your identity changes. It has to be more than forgiven them. Sickness is a symptom of our problem, not the source of our problem. We don't need a change in activity. We need a change in identity. See, it's the condition that we carry that's the problem. Because we carry this sinful nature. Well, Pastor Tyler, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty good person. I mean, I don't, I don't lie too bad on my taxes. And, like, I try to treat people good, and, you know, I I help people when I can. I'm a pretty good person. I want to tell you today that before we know Jesus, we are not sick in our sin. We're not... We're not slightly affected by our sin. Look what Paul said in his letter to the Ephesians. This this is the state of us before we meet Jesus. Once, put this scripture on the screen. Once you were dead. It's not that it was just kind of bad. It's not that you were just kind of sick. You were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Before Jesus, you were dead. So I don't need to be cleaned. I don't even need to be forgiven. I need to be raised to life. The gospel is not that you can be forgiven. The gospel is not that you can be clean. The gospel is that you can have life breathed in to the dead spirit that you carry because of the sin nature. That's the gospel of the cross. He wants to make you alive. We weren't sick. We were dead. You realize how many people are walking around our world that are not alive? They've never experienced life. Well, what is life? I mean, how, how can they truly know what a fulfilling life is? Again, you go to secular sources. I went to a really scholarly place this week called Google, and I typed in, how do you find fulfillment in life? And I read articles from, you know, Christian sources, but also from sources that I knew they weren't Christian because I couldn't even say the title of the website. So I I couldn't say it in this company right now. So I knew that was not a Christian source. And so I started reading these articles. And do you know that all of them, Christian, secular, all of them, in some way, shape, or form, when you get down to the bottom where they give you the number one thing you can do to to find your fulfillment in life is they say you have to find purpose. You find purpose, you find fulfillment. So how do we find our purpose? Well, ultimately, the way you find your purpose is you go back to where it all started. You want to find out why something was created? Go back to when it was created and see what it was created for. That will ultimately tell you. So Genesis chapter 1, God creates man and woman. Why does he create them? He creates them for two reasons. Genesis 1 verse 27 says this. So God created man in his own image. That's our first reason for being alive. God created us in his own image. He wanted us to reflect his character. We were created. The purpose that we were given on this earth was to reflect the character of God. The next thing, I don't have the scripture on there, but in Genesis chapter 3, scripture says that God came down and walked with man in the cool of the day. So we were created to, first of all, reflect his character, second of all, walk in relationship with him. You, your purpose in life, 
The reason you are on this earth is to do two things. Reflect the character of God and walk in relationship with God. That's it. Every other thing that you do, your vocation should be an outflow from that. Your family life should be an outflow from that. Your friend circle should be an outflow from that. Your purpose is not to be a lawyer. Your purpose is not to be a doctor. Your purpose is not to be an athlete. Your purpose is to reflect the nature of God and walk in relationship with him. And from that, other opportunities will present themselves. But that's the purpose that we were created with. And it was awesome. Adam and Eve were walking in this perfect relationship. They were walking, reflecting the perfect nature of God to the world around them in dominion and authority. And then this thing called sin was inserted into the equation. And the moment that sin came into the equation, they could no longer fulfill their purpose. Which I don't know about you, I, I, I think about this, and maybe you've had this thought. If you've, if you've known the story of Adam and Eve, you've thought, man, Why did they have to screw it up for everybody else? Like, I mean, they lived in the garden. It was awesome. Like, he had a pet lion, I'm sure. I mean, that'd be cool, you know. It just just seemed like it was the perfect scenario. But here's the deal. Let me ask you this, and you don't have to be honest, but I would encourage you to be honest. How many of you in this room have ever made a mistake? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, me too. Lots of them. Probably today I've, I've made several. I say that to say this. If Adam and Eve wouldn't, have been the ones to eat the fruit. And if somehow it went through all the generations and it got to me, I'd have been the guy. It'd have been me. So truly thankful for Adam and Eve. They took one for the team. Like, because all of us in this room just said I made a mistake. So we would have been the ones that messed it up for everybody else. So honestly, I'm thankful for that. But Adam and Eve inserts sin into this equation And they can no longer fulfill their purpose because they could not reflect the nature of God because in God there is no sin. They forfeited their purpose. And here's the truth. No matter what flavor of sin it is, no matter how big or little the sin may seem, sin always inhibits our capacity to fulfill the purpose of God. Always. You will never be able to be who God has called you to be until you're willing to let go of your sin. And that's a hard truth that we have trouble walking with because the truth is we enjoy sin. It feels good, usually. Sin is pleasurable for a season. That's in Scripture. But the end thereof is death. So they couldn't reflect his nature. And God shows up in Genesis chapter 3 after they've taken a bite of this fruit. They've inserted sin into the equation. And he begins to tell them the consequences for their actions. This isn't God punishing them. This is God saying, hey, this is the natural repercussion for what you've done. God isn't saying, I'm pronouncing judgment. He's just giving them an informational lecture on here's what's about to happen. But before God ever mentions the fact that man's going to have to toil the ground, before he ever says that woman is going to have pain in childbearing, before he ever says that death is going to be inserted to the equation, he can't even get to the sentencing part of the hearing before he looks at Satan and says, listen, you might have got a win today, but there's going to be someone of the seed of woman that is going to defeat you. In the midst of proclaiming judgment, God's says, I am going to restore the relationship that you have broken between me and my people. Immediately, God begins to proclaim this. He prophesies this. And this prophecy doesn't take place until 2,000 years later. When a virgin named Mary conceives without ever having been with a man. I said this in first service. I always read that story, and it's really funny to us how we can, I think we read the Bible with the full story in view. But like, man, I just want you to put yourself with me in this situation, that your fiancé comes to you and says, hey, I'm about to have a baby. Don't worry. It's from God. Like, I've not, I know I've not been with anybody else. You're like, oh, yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, sure. Thankfully, the angel showed up to, I, I just think that's always a funny part of the story. That She said, it's from God, and he's like, Anyways, that has nothing to do with my message. I just think it's fun. Virgin conceives. And she has this son named Jesus who's born in a cave. He's a king. He's born in a cave. Nobody's there, but a few shepherds show up. Some animals are around. It's nothing fitting for him. He's raised in a somewhat impoverished family, son of a carpenter, 
nothing significant really about him. But the thing that is significant is he's raised in this home. And the Bible says that he was tempted in every way like us, but didn't sin. He lived the life that you and I would have to live to go to heaven. He did it. He did what you, when you raised your hand just a second ago and said, I made a mistake, Jesus could never have raised his hand for that. He never made a mistake. He lived a perfect life. And then at 30 years old, he began a ministry where he began to heal lame legs. And he began to call dead people out of tombs. And he began to open blind eyes and make dumb mouths speak. And he began to teach the word of God with such authority that people heard him teaching and preaching. And they said, we've never heard anyone talk about the law or the prophets in the way that this man does. There's an authority there. Jesus did nothing but heal, love, teach, and better the lives of everyone that he was around. And ultimately they crucified him for it. And he went to the cross and he gave his life and he paid this high price that you and I have been talking about this entire time. But the beautiful thing is that I I think that the realization that I've always had that this week has just been made so real to me is that Jesus didn't die for my sin. He died instead of my sin. The gospel is not that Jesus wants to cleanse you. It's that he took your place. Every punishment that you and I deserve for the wrongs that we've committed were put on that cross. He took our place. This is the gospel. Jesus was the protocol that God enacted to restore relationship with man, knowing that you and I could never experience the fullness of life, which is to reflect the nature of God and walk in relationship with him. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I have come for one reason, that you may have life. You're dead in your sins, but I've come that you may have life. This is the beauty of this Easter season, of this resurrection season. is that Jesus came to give us life. So quickly, let's, let's recap this. We're about to close in just a minute. Let's recap this. You were created for relationship and reflection of the character of God. Sin eroded our ability to do either one of those things. And no amount of being forgiven could restore us to relationship. So Jesus gave his life as a ransom. There's a word today that I need you to know and I need you to focus on. He gave his life as a substitute. In theology, there's this concept known as substitutionary atonement. That my wrongs, the sin nature, the sin of man had to be paid for. But rather than making us do it, Jesus said, let me take that on myself. Jesus took your place. He paid the price for our sin. The price was so high because it was more than the price of forgiveness. It was the price of substitution. My favorite scripture In the Bible is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21. It says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He traded places. I mean, this is I was trying to think of a way to equate this yesterday. Like, Like, this is the best that I came up with, right? This is the best that I came up with. It's like if I was working on a minimum wage job, And I racked up millions of dollars worth of debt. And Elon Musk said, hey, I'm going to come and not pay with the resources that I have at my disposal. I'm going to come take your minimum wage job and start working and pay it off that way. That's what Jesus did. He didn't stand up from the majesty of heaven and say, forgiven. He came and became what we were and lived the life that we were supposed to live and then died the death that we were supposed to die. It's the gospel of instead of. It was supposed to be me, but instead, it was him. And that's, that's, that's what the cross is all about, but we're not here to talk about the cross today because the truth is the story didn't end there. Three days later, a stone was rolled away, and the tomb was empty. I heard one pastor this week say that the tomb 
is the only tourist attraction in the world that people go to to see what isn't there. Still to this day, people pay thousands of dollars to go and look inside the tomb. And can I tell you, his body is not there. They laid him there, they left him there dead, but he walked out alive. He is alive today. Well, what does that mean for me? Why does that matter? I mean, why, why, I mean, is that just something we need to get excited about? Cool, God rose from the dead. Because here's the thing, the cross was the price, but the tomb was the prototype. A prototype is something that is created with the intention of reproducing that thing. When Jesus walked out of the grave, that was not supposed to be an isolated incident. Go back to our text today. Put up that original, that original verse. That I may know him, the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. If any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. This is God's will for your life. Not that you just know about the resurrection. That you experience the resurrection. I said it like this today. Today we don't only get to celebrate the resurrection. We get to participate in the resurrection. This is the gospel. Well, how do I get there? He said in that verse, put, put the scripture back up. He said that in order to experience the power of the resurrection, you've got to be conformed to his death. Well, what does that mean? Well, thankfully today, um, we don't have a line of crosses outside that we're going to all go, you know, just nail each other to. That would be a little weird. We definitely would get on the news, so, uh, but we're not going to do that today. That's not, that's not in the agenda. That's not what we're talking about when he says conformed to his death. Truly what this means, and this is what has wrecked me all week, because I think it brings all of us, no matter our background, no matter where you're from, no matter what you did before you came today, no matter what you did last week, is that to die being conformed to his death is that you and I have to die to the concept that we're good enough. Or the reversal of that, you can be like, well, I don't have any problem with that because I know how wretched I am. That's just a, a, a reversal form of the same problem. The truth is, it's not about us, one way or the other. To die, be made conformable to his death, is to come to the conclusion that it was never about me. All of this is about him. And when you allow yourself to die to that concept of being good enough or not being good enough, you're able to experience the power of the resurrection. Well, what's the power of the resurrection? When Jesus came out of the tomb, he wasn't the same as when he went in. You know, this is, this is kind of preachy, and it's not necessarily a part of my message today, but I re, I, the thing that I thought of today is that Jesus came out of the tomb, but not everything he took in with him did. Because you realize that all of the sin and the shame and the disgrace, and the mistakes, all of that was still on him when they laid him in the tomb. And all of that is still in the grave. Because when he rose again, he didn't bring my shame with him. He didn't bring my sin with him. And so let me just say, this: I'm, I'm, I'm beyond my notes now. I don't know who this is for. But can I tell you, stop prophesying resurrection to your shame. Stop calling it out of the grave. The mistakes that you made 10 years ago, the mistakes that you made 5 years ago, the brokenness of your past, whatever it is, stop speaking life to that, that Jesus took on himself and allowed to be crucified with him. Because he wants you to experience the power of the resurrection. To where you live this life. That says, I'm not good enough. But it doesn't matter. Because it's not about me. It's never been about me. There are so many people in here, I don't, I don't know your background. I don't know who you are. I don't know what your activity is like. I have no idea. But I know in my life that there are a lot of times that I come before God. And I just really feel like I just ain't really good enough for you to want to be in like relationship with me because you see pastor Tyler he sees Tyler 
I ain't always wearing a suit on a stage on Sundays. In fact, I'm almost never wearing a suit on a stage. You've been here for a few weeks since launch. You realize this is not the normal thing for me. I'm sweating like a crazy person up here. But I come before him and I think, man, I'm just not, I'm not good enough for you to have a relationship with me. And the thing is, when you truly enact this process of, of conforming to his death by stopping to think about yourself, by letting your opinion of yourself not be what dictates your life, and you allow it to be this, this transformational instead of reception for the gospel that you realize he went instead of you. When you stand before God, he doesn't see you. He sees his son. He sees Jesus. And so get this, when I say I'm not good enough, to him, I'm saying Jesus ain't good enough. To him, I'm saying the finished work of the cross wasn't enough. And can I tell you today that that's why the enemy puts those voices in your head? That's why he says it, because his entire purpose all along has been to discredit the work of God. Maybe you're in here today and you're like, Pastor Tyler, you don't even know. I was doing drugs last night. You don't know the, the relationships I've been with. You don't know how many partners I've had in the last month. You don't know how many marriages I've been through. You don't know. You're right, I don't know. But I do know it doesn't matter. Because when Jesus went to the cross, he took every mistake, every wrong, and he wore them on himself and he bled every drop of blood so that he could carry them into the tomb and leave them there. And today, I just think God wanted me to let you know that that high price that he paid, it wasn't just for me. It wasn't just for the person that you see down the road that you think, yeah, that's, that's a good Christian, I can see. No, he paid that price for you and he wants relationship not just with them not just with that part he wants relationship with you so I want you to do me a favor today I want you to bow your heads with me